Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Wednesday, June 6, 2012. Here's a quick look at what we have lined up for you this evening. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, musician Jordan Page spreads the message of liberty. Plus, Patrick Henningsen reports on Sheriff Joe Arpaio's latest evidence regarding Obama's birth certificate. Then, hundreds of leaked Bilderberg documents declaring that nationalism is dangerous. All that and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. All that and more coming up during the next 30 minutes or so, but first, let's jump right into our top headlines as we begin this evening with an update on last week's Bilderberg Conference from Chantilly, Virginia. As we have just learned that four separate eyewitnesses inside the Westfields Hotel have told the London Guardian that Mitt Romney was indeed in attendance at Bilderberg. As most of you are aware, an invite to Bilderberg has routinely proven to be beneficial to future presidents and prime ministers. Four years ago, for example, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, well, they gave reporters the slip to attend Bilderberg 2008. And Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, well, they were also groomed at Bilderberg during the 1990s. So perhaps Romney in attendance suggests that he might be the elite's next choice in the upcoming presidential election. Only time will tell. But at this point, I mean, what difference does it really make, folks? I mean, Obama or Romney, they're basically both controlled by the offshore banking cartel that, that run them both. And, um, you know, but some of you out there are still going to insist on electing or uh, choosing between the lesser of two evils. You're gonna vote for the lesser of two evils, Obama or Romney. You know, it's kinda of like, who should I vote for, Caligula or Nero? Caligula or Nero? I mean, uh, I'm gonna go with Nero because he wasn't quite as evil as Caligula. Yeah, it's pretty silly, isn't it? All right, speaking of Bilderberg, we have breaking news tonight as we have just obtained leaked Bilderberg documents, hundreds of documents. And this from the 1966 meeting. This is a WikiLeaks-sized data dump, or a BuildyLeaks-sized data dump, if you will. And we will be actually going over this in more detail during the next weeks and days ahead as we continue to, to discover and uncover what all the documents contain and what they mean. So far, we've learned that during the 1966 Bilderberg meeting in Germany, well, they determined that nationalism is dangerous. Here's Aaron Dykes with that report. Documents from inside the Bilderberg Group meetings. This goes back to the 1966 conference. It took place in Wiesbaden, Germany, right outside of Frankfurt. Today, it is still the base of the U.S. consulate in Germany. It is also the base of occupied Germany back in the Soviet era. Now, these documents come out of the private library. They're marked not for distribution. They're marked confidential. They are marked protected by copyright law, but they're leaked anyway. We're going to break them to you. They come out of Senator Fred Harris's collection. He is a Democrat out of Oklahoma, still alive. I believe it is in his early 90s. He ended up being a two-term senator, but here he was in 1966, two years after being brought in, just on the heels of JFK's assassination. In 1964, he was groomed very early on to be a Bilderberg member. He, of course, was on the Senate Subcommittee on National Security and other branches. He was engaged in a study on the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and was on a subcommittee in the Senate, which related to that. Now, that's why he was brought there, because that was the major topic of the 1966 meeting. Now, let's start here. We've got personal and strictly confidential, not for publication, either in whole or in part from the collection of the Honorable Fred Harris. Bilderberg Meetings, Wiesbaden Conference, March 25th, 1966. Yes, they used to have these meetings in March rather than late May, June, when they now currently have them. And so right here, we have a signed copy of the invitation to Senator Fred Harris out of Oklahoma, signed by the Prince of the Netherlands. He, of course, is the founder of Bilderberg. He was inspired to create the group by this man right here, Dr. Joseph Redinger. He was a Jesuit 
he was a advocate of the secret steering groups. Now, Bilderberg itself, you have to understand, came out of the Cecil Rhodes roundtable model. Cecil Rhodes was one of these great robber barons. He basically conquered much of Africa. He created a false flag through the newspapers he owned in what used to be four territories in South Africa. He created the Boer War. He stirred it up himself personally using his top very influential friends. They created conflict that led to Boer Wars number one and number two and then the state we now know as South Africa. He was hailed as a hero by the queen, given all kinds of awards and designations. But more importantly, he worked with Victor Rothschild and other members, I'm sorry, yes, of the Rothschild family to set up these secret steering groups, the Cecil Rhodes Roundtables. This became in the United States, the Council on Foreign Relations. This became in the UK, the Royal Institute on International Affairs. The other Western countries had their counterparts as well. Now today we see Russia having a Russian Institute on International Affairs. China now has a branch and they steer so much a policy by meeting partially in public, partially in secret with the most influential people in the world to dictate policy. Yes, Bilderberg does dictate policy. These documents documents support that claim, so does all of our research and history. Anyway, I'll read from the letter. It is short. It comes out of The Hague, the address for Prince of the Netherlands, that is Prince Bernhard. Today, his daughter, Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands, continues his legacy at Bilderberg. He sent it out in December 1965. I have the honor to invite you to the next Bilderberg meeting, which will be had at held at the Hotel Nasserhof at Wiesbaden, Germany, 25, 26, 27, March 1966. Then on page two, he lists the agenda. It's quite short, but extremely important. Should NATO be reorganized and if how? And point number two, the future of world economic relations, especially between industrial and developing countries. We'll get to that in just a moment, but first I'll show you a few exhibits. Uh, among these are the letters inviting Senator Harris, explaining the travel arrangements and more. They come from the head of the U.S. branch of Bilderberg. It was Joseph E. Johnson in the 60s. Notice the letterhead, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a very important body. All these robber barons of the early 20th century were hated by the public for monopolizing industry and for lording it over the people. Their Pinkerton forces, in the case of the Rockefellers, killed people for going on strike, etc. But they learn how to use the growing PR mechanisms that Edward Bernays, Ivy Lee, and other experts set up to fool people and to think they were helping you because they named their organizations things like Peace, International Peace, Carnegie Endowment. And so... A very important arm of Bilderberg today, Jessica T. Matthews heads the Carnegie Endowment, so that trend continues. Anyway, he's inviting the American members to the meeting, telling them what to expect, and really telling them also who they can trust and talk to within the Senate. You will see in different letters here. And that's part of the larger trend of how our Congress was infiltrated, how they took over the country from within. It's not the outside enemy, it's the inside nefarious scheming, all particularly all these foundations, which were later investigated in the 50s. They tried to have those documents destroyed. People like Israby did not let that happen. Thankfully, we have many of those documents now. Anyway, those are on file. Notice they come from Carnegie, First National City Bank, all basically robber baron entities. I believe First National was connected to Rockefeller. If not, certainly someone important. I will set those aside. And we have hundreds of documents. You'll have to forgive me for trying to organize these on the air because there's so many. But, of course, we have here a lot of the handwritten notes from Senator Fred Harris inside the 1966 Bilderberg Conference. He's got headers here for each of the countries as they spoke and the different speakers. He's got names, of course, for the American delegates. In the case of many of the European delegates that he probably didn't know personally, he has either their country or how they were secretary or what have you for different entities. And Handwriting is not always the easiest to read, but it's it's very important. You see recurrent themes about NATO, which again, Fred Harris was studying the military integration, how it's necessary. That's from a UK delegate. Uh, 
the organizational aspects, and on and on about how nationalism is what's bad, how nationalism is contagious, how nationalism is part of this pre-1914 mentality. Right here, we have John J. McCloy. He happens to be a very important figure. He was a member of Skull and Bones, and he had a number of very high up posts. He was inside, of course, our government's he was considered one of the wise men under JFK and Johnson and other presidents. He had positions including assistant secretary of war during World War II, but he was simultaneously a lawyer for IG Farben. He was responsible for policy for things like, should we bomb the trains that go to Auschwitz, which we now know were concentration camps? Well, ultimately that didn't happen. And you have to ask yourself why. Was it because he was connected on the inside to IG Farben? Where, I might add, Prince Bernhard, the founder of of Bilderberg was the head of IG Farben on the board. Well, it really speaks for itself because all these Skull and Bones members were caught funding the Nazi mechanism, not because they believed Hitler would conquer Europe, but because they wanted to integrate Europe by creating a boogeyman. At least that's what I believe after having studied it. When they got caught, uh, they didn't really get caught because they had a mechanism in the Netherlands, where Prince Bernhard is from, w in which they could quickly transfer assets from the Nazi mechanism back to the Anglosphere, the Atlantic Sphere, based in the UK and the United States, and they indeed did that. Now, John J. McCloy was head of the World Bank. He was chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, which is the Rockefeller organ. He was chairman of the Ford Foundation, chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, and a member of the Warren Commission, so you could see some of his tentacles there. Anyway, in these handwritten notes from Senator Fred Harris, you see things about how de Gaulle and his nationalism could spread, how it's troubling, how nationalism stimulates nationalism, how this pre-1914 mentality is dangerous. He says, when you stress independence, flexibility, and nationalism, you're really going back to the pre-1914 mishmash. That again is a quote from Senator Fred Harris's handwritten notes while listening to the speeches at Bilderberg, in this case from John J. McCloy, in other cases from the other senators, from the other delegates, from the other people from this world government system they've been pursuing now for more than a century. How de Gaulle... And it's just repeated talk about De Gaulle, how the surging nationalism in France could spread to Germany, Western Germany, of course, at the time, and on and on, and how we urgently need NATO to be built up. That was the key, again, as I pointed out, on the agenda in the 1966 meeting. Here's some of the handwritten notes from the Austrian delegate, and they're all on the list uh, right over here, I might add. One second while I find that list. At any rate, it goes on. Now, one of the most important delegates at this meeting was the United Auto Workers president. His name was Reuter. And his notes are coming up. And the point is that all the most important people inside U.S. foreign policy, which had become very hegemonic after World War II, were part of either secret societies or connected to these world government pursuing foundations that connect to the robber barons. And that is really how we were taken over from within. I think the last two presidents in this country were clearly Eisenhower and JFK. They both had their own baggage. They were not perfect people by any means. But I think by the end, they had both begun to figure out that we were not really working for America, but a foreign offshore interest, as Alex often terms it. Now, right here, we have Walter P. Reuther. He is the head of United Auto Workers. And again, here are Senator Fred Harris's notes from within that meeting. He says, quote, NATO is in trouble because common fears are reduced. And he says nationalism is dangerous. Nationalism is dangerous. Is is underlined. Nationalism is the problem. We must pursue peace, world government, building community, regionalism, some of the others say in these notes. And it goes on and on. Of course, it's going to take some time to break down the handwritten notes out of the 1966 conference from the Bilderberg meetings in Wiesbaden, Germany. And they are bombshell. We have, of course, the list. It's not only the founder, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who later had to step down because of his bribery scandals. It's people from the Carnegie Endowment for International peace. It's David Rockefeller of the Chase Manhattan Bank and the World Empire. It's half a dozen or more of his emissaries and appointees at Standard Oil at the other entities they control. It's important 
Europeans like Giovanni Agnelli of the Fiat Company, who helped build the European Union through the steel and coal community that they built and intended to grow. It's people like Marcus Wallenberg out of Sweden. Now today, his son Jacob Wallenberg still attends and still steers their agenda. On the U.S. side, we have a lot of important people, particularly out of the NATO sphere. Most of them are skull and bones or connected directly to it. Among them are the writers of that year's policy paper, Robert R. Bowie, Should NATO Be Reorganized and If So, How? March 1966. And in this policy paper, Robert R. Bowie, who is a member of the CFR, who's a member of the Trilateral Commission, who attended these Bilderberg meetings and is a John J. McCloy acolyte, who we talked about on the other segment, wrote about how NATO should be built up, how the Atlantic Alliance should be fostered. Atlantic Alliance, of course, between the United States and the European sphere, how that should not only be a military counter threat to the Soviets, but that even if there weren't a Soviet threat, they should still use it to integrate Europe as they began under the Marshall Plan, the Schuman Plan, and much more. That's a 20-page policy paper, and it's just bombshell. Meanwhile, at the same meeting, they met on the development of finance in the international and developed world and discussed how it would continue to be steered. They use these agreements to bind the developing countries so they can suck out their resources for corporate gain and control the populations quite literally through food supply, through conditionalities that dictate the way the countries will develop. They do not have independence. They think national sovereignty is pure poison and that only world government is the future. Here's the other policy paper from the 1966 meeting, the future of world economic relations especially between industrial and developing countries by J. Ten Bergen. That is a professor who undoubtedly works directly for Prince Bernhard in 1966 out of Rotterdam, summarizing how entities including USAID, the Agency for International Development, the World Bank, the United Nations, and many others will control and dictate exports, from the industrialized world and will figure out how to balance the growing world population by using food as a weapon. That later came out some six, seven, eight years later under Henry Kissinger and National State Memorandum number 200, where he literally said food as a weapon. Just disgusting stuff. And we've got other key members. The top delegates on the U.S. side were, of course, Joseph E. Johnson of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's in these documents inviting people like Senator Fred Harris, whose library these documents were leaked out of. There's also George W. Ball. He was under Secretary of State under JFK, continued to be a key advisor under Johnson after JFK's death. And he is connected to and advising them. You can see in this document how, quote, in the past, it's been our custom to have Under Secretary of State George W. Ball advising the American delegation. It goes on, Ball is one of the architects of the Vietnam War. He told JFK in five years, we'll have 300,000 troops in Vietnam. JFK told him he was crazy and it would never happen basically over my dead body. And I think you can connect the dots from there. There's other important stuff, but you see here how the NATO document written by the Skull and Bones related acolytes, should NATO be reorganized, was echoed in the Atlantic Community Quarterly, the NATO Journal, how it was echoed in Senate hearings, the Atlantic Alliance Treaty and Related. Next, we have news, and this is disturbing news from the TSA, as we have just learned that a congresswoman has revealed a report documenting how the TSA is hiring pedophiles and child pornographers to conduct pat-downs. This report details highly disturbing cases where pedophiles and child pornographers wearing federal law enforcement uniforms are not only patting down unsuspecting travelers, but in many cases, stealing valuables from their bags. Enough is enough. It's time for Congress to step in and demand accountability. And this was from, that was from Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee. And this is something we've known all along, folks, because, I mean, they have to hire sickos and pedophiles to work there because nobody else in their right mind is ever going to work, want to work for the TSA. And that just confirms everything we've been telling you over the last few years. 
Next up, Ron Paul delegates are assaulted and arrested in Louisiana. Now, this actually happened over the weekend as the Louisiana State Republican Convention descended into chaos Saturday morning when several delegates actually ended up being arrested and the convention chairman was thrown to the ground by police. <laughs> This is incredible. Actually, I think he's under arrest for uh, well, like the report. Who wants to file the report? For this well, sources report that state party officials panicked when it became clear that Ron Paul delegates commanded a decisive majority of the delegates on the floor. They had at least 100 and, uh, 111 of 180, 62%. Now, many observers expressed shock that the establishment would resort to such violent tactics against fellow Republicans. And we are joined now by musician Jordan Page, who the Washington Post calls the most popular artist amongst Ron Paul supporters. And Jordan is about to catch a plane out here to Texas where he will make his 13th appearance with Ron Paul as he has been actively touring the entire country, spreading the message of liberty. And Jordan, it's good to have you with us on the show. Hey, what do you think about the behavior in Louisiana over the weekend? I think it's indicative of the, uh, the grotesque corruption in the establishment, in the GOP. I, I, I don't think it's salvageable. I think these guys are, are running scared because they know about our numbers. They know about the numbers of delegates, and they are trying to stifle uh, the, the message of freedom at any cost. You know, and, and, and now we're starting to see it's becoming violent, and I think that's a really uh, sign of the times, for sure. But I think the establishment was actually caught with their pants down uh, when it comes to the delegation process, the, the whole selection process, because now Ron Paul, under the radar, you know, he could actually dominate the nationwide delegate process that the establishment media, they called this long ago for, for Romney. They called this in Romney's favor months ago. Sure, but... We all know we all know who they work for. You know, I mean, do you want the puppet on the left or the puppet on the right? And you know, Ron Paul represents the antithesis of everything that they stand for. And now that the delegates are going to be unbound, so I hear. I mean, it really is anybody's game. Calling calling it for Romney is just words. You know, when you hear Ron Paul's name being chanted throughout the halls of the RNC, we'll see who comes out on top. And contrary to the mainstream media, just want to let everybody know, Ron Paul has not dropped out of the presidential race. They'd like you to believe that, but he's simply no longer going to use his campaign money to go after the popular vote that the establishment is, is actually stealing from him. So he's very much in this race. And um, what do you expect to happen? I mean, this is very exciting. A lot of good things are happening. Uh, what do you expect from Tampa? At the very least, I, I expect... A, a major upset, at the very least, a major upset. Uh, I think I think the the, the Ron Paul delegates are going to play a massive role in the in the whole process, and you know, 
we've seen conventions like this before. Maybe maybe not we've seen them in our lifetime, but they have happened in the 20th century uh, where someone came in that they thought had no chance and ended up being the nominee. So I think that you're going to you're going to have just tens and tens and tens of thousands of people converging on Tampa to support Ron Paul, whether he likes it or not. <laughs> And uh, we're all going to be there to support that message and support his mission, which has always been freeing minds. I mean, like to me, that's the real goal here: is freeing minds. And when the when the world the world is waking up, and when the world sees, you know, the, his name just everywhere in Tampa. I mean, you can't you can't pay Romney supporters to show up. Well, no. and, and I was just going to mention that, and you've seen this firsthand for yourself as well as I have, and and, and as well as all the Ron Paul supporters. I mean, how many Mitt Romney for president bumper stickers have you seen in any town USA? I mean, he is clearly the popular candidate. He has the most support amongst, uh, you know, active veterans, active military, I mean. And, um, you know, everywhere he goes, he's a rock star. He draws the big crowds. He fills stadiums. And, um, and now you are there, you know, a lot of these places playing your music and, uh, your song is even more uh, has gotten so popular that people I understand people are even know the words to your song Liberty when they uh, as you appear at these different shows. So tell us about the rock star kind of atmosphere and how that compares to like you said Mitt Romney who's lucky if he if he gets you know a couple hundred people in one showing. Well, your first question about Romney bumper stickers, I've never seen one. <laughs> I've never seen even one this entire time, not one. And I and I go you know, coast to coast, and I never see them. Um, it is really an amazing thing. I'll, I'll tell you about a, a recent one that wasn't as rock starish, but it was really amazing. Was the the Philly Freedom Fest uh, in, in end of April because it was pouring rain. It was pouring rain. It was cold, and 4,300 people stood in the cold, pouring you know monsoon for five hours just just to get a glimpse of the man, just to hear him speak and. You know, when I was in Las Vegas with him back in February, um, the, the crowd roared so loud that I think it shocked him a little bit. I was standing next to him on stage, and the crowd was so loud it was it made your ears crack. And 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 he he took a step back. Actually, I got a picture of him taking a step back from the crowd. And I mean, like the the time is now. You know, the energy is here, and and people want to be free of federal tyranny. They want. They, they they want to run their own lives, make their own decisions, and they want to get out of these wars. And they want they don't they don't want the kind of future that the new world order has in store for us. And and they see Ron Paul and his message as the way to do that. I would I agree with them. All right, we're about to roll a clip of your video. It's called Liberty, and I actually saw this for the first time like a week and a half and a uh, week and a half ago. My son pointed out to me, and uh, you know how ironic that here we are. A couple weeks later that I'm sitting here talking to you, uh, you're an outstanding musician, and this song is fantastic. We're going to take a look at a clip right now. Why do we sit down when all should be standing? And why do we back down at the critical moment Like running away from the waves of the ocean We head for the hills with the high tide approaching As sand slips away from the castle When it's time to stand upright Why do we falter like placing our freedom on the sacrificial altar we hold tight to our fears and defend our oppressors as we fight for their lives and become the transgressors as pacifists transform to violent aggressors but i'm only a stranger here i'm alone find strange but what can one man do alone is there what can one man do alone 
And that was a clip from Jordan Page's Liberty. And, you know, we're talking about how Ron Paul has this, uh, you know, kind of rock and roll uh, aura about him as wherever he goes. Like I always say, he's a rock star. And the thing is, is how many musicians, for example, have band together or written songs about Mitt Romney? I mean, Ron Paul is, is spurring excitement everywhere. You've got artists, musicians all coming together. You are certainly one of them. And you're also going to be in Fort Worth tomorrow. And this will be for the Concert for Liberty with Ron Paul and Jordan Page. That's tomorrow, Thursday, June 7th at 6.30 p.m. This will be at the River Ranch Stockyards in Fort Worth, Texas. Tell us a little bit more about the show. Well, I am coming down to support the Ron Paul delegates and the, the Ron Paul contingency. You know, I mean, the RNC is uh, starting tomorrow night, tomorrow night's kickoff for that. And Ron's going to be speaking at the convention. And he's going to come over uh, when he's done there and, uh, and address his supporters who, who could, couldn't be at the convention. I'm going to do about an hour or so of uh, music in, uh, in support of him and, and in support of freedom. And then he's going to come and speak. And we're expecting a sell out crowd we, tickets have been uh, selling like like hotcakes uh, the Paul campaign's been doing some email blasts about it and getting the word out and so have we and I think it's going to be a pretty pretty awesome event and uh, it's it's cool because it's kind of like the anti Santorum rally because Santorum's having an event I, I don't know if it's Thursday or Friday but it's two hundred dollars to hear this guy speak and uh, you know our, our events 20 bucks you get two beers and parking a concert and for me and Ron Paul. So I think we're giving people a much better deal. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And, and to be honest, I would be going if I didn't have to work tomorrow, but I'm sure eventually I'll catch up with you. Did you have any more scheduled, any other dates after Texas? Oh, yeah, I got lots. I'm going to be at Pork Fest in New Hampshire, the Porcupine Freedom Festival, um, Friday, uh, June 22nd. I'll be doing a show, a headlining show from 8 to 10. Then I'll be at the Peace Unity Freedom Festival in Breckenridge, Colorado, where they've got the uh, the alternative local currency Mountain Hours. Um, they're they're kind of sticking it to the Fed and, and developing their own currency nice. and kind of taking it down. <laughs> I'm doing their festival on uh, the 6th of July, and the Utah Freedom Festival is going to be in August, as well as the Liberty Love Fest, August 17th. That's going to happen in Worcester, Massachusetts. People can go to my website, Jordan Page Music. Uh, dot com and see where I'm going to be because uh, Ron Paul stock is in Georgia that's happening the 24th or the 25th of August and then the Paul Festival in Tampa as soon as they can get a, a venue because the RNC has been holding out on them for the fairgrounds they're like they're kind of stonewalling them about giving them a venue imagine that so well yeah right well we'll see what happens with that but I'm sure it's going to happen no matter what because uh, there's going to be you know tens and tens of thousands of people that want to come to yeah, it yeah. and they've got some pretty big names um Besides Jordan Page, obviously, there are going to be a lot of a lot of great performers coming to that. So, just check out the website, and I'll be, and you know I'll be uh, I'll be all over the map. Awesome. Well, we just showed uh, uh, your website on the on the video just now, and um, you know you know consider me a fan, and I'm sure we'll catch up here sometime in the near future. Until then, best of luck to you tomorrow, and uh, you know come back on the show, come join us again sometime. I'd love to. Thanks so much for having. All right, bud. Thank you. Okay, and that does it for the first half of the show. But when we return, we will be joined by Infowars.com uh, contributing editor and investigative journalist Patrick Henningsen. We're going to talk about Obama's fake birth certificate. And he actually got a chance to catch up with Sheriff Joe Arpaio to discuss that very subject. Patrick Henningsen, when we return, right after this. Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com. Patriots are talking. This past week, it's been about the clandestine elite globalists meeting Bilderberg. Any of them ever heard of the U.S. Logan Act? Oh, you mean that pesky little federal law that states unauthorized citizens shall not coerce with foreign governments unless they face to be fined and imprisoned? Well, users on planet InfoWars have, and they're not sitting idly by. 
Users like Jock Doubleday are completing missions to write articles about the Bilderberg attendees. In his article, The Devil Wears a Heart Necklace, he features Heather Reisman. And you can read more about her role at Bilderberg Group and her influence outside of the meeting at planetinfowars.com. Check out this and more. Find out what patriots are talking about. Sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at InfoWars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure, but if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. And we are back. Thank you for joining us. I'm Darren McBreen, and this is the InfoWars Nightly News. Up next, we are joined by InfoWars.com contributing editor and investigative journalist Patrick Henningsen, who's been hot on the trail of the Obama birth certificate scandal, as there are clearly inconsistencies, and that's saying it nicely, with the long-form birth certificate released by the White House last year but also what appears to be a forgery of Obama's selective service form as well. Not to mention, well, the huge list of documents that Barack Obama refuses to release to the American people. We're talking passport records, school records, uh, Illinois, Illinois State Bar Association records, and so on. So the question is, if Obama has nothing to hide, then why suppress all these historical records why hide behind the mainstream media and criticize, you know, accuse critics of being either racist or paranoid? And we are joined now by Patrick Henningsen, who joins us from London, England. Patrick, it's good to have you on today. Good to be with you, Darren. Hey, now, um, you interviewed, you got a chance to interview Joe Arpaio uh, personally not too long ago, as well as spend a great a deal of time with his veteran investigators, the Cold Case Posse. And um, tell us why they decided to investigate Obama's birth certificate to begin with and what they learned in the process. Well, the uh, initial investigation was prompted by uh, a citizens group, about 200 and some odd people represented, came to the sheriff's office at Maricopa County and said, uh, we believe that these documents are a forgery. We're talking about the White House PDF birth certificate, which was posted on the White House website in April 2011, okay? Now, Ohio said on to the press and on record from the beginning, uh, Joe Ohio said, um, we're, I'm doing this to clear the president's name, okay? Whatever people might think about his political leanings or what have you, uh, he did say that on record. He said he would like to clear the president and get this over with because it's a, a national embarrassment and it's it's uh, it brings shame to the office of the, to the of the president and brings shame to the White House. So the cold case posse got on the case, and lo and behold, um, they have probable cause now uh, that both Obama's birth certificate, the one he released, the one the White House released, and his Selective Service draft card are both forgeries. That's beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, they've been tested. They've been compared. Uh, the uh, Nordic twins from Hawaii, born at the same time as Obama. The microfilm was produced, and that was found to compare with Obama's birth certificate, uh, the, the PDF copy, not, not to match. So all Arpaio is saying, and all the uh, investigators and people like Dr. Jerome Corsi, all they're really saying is, show us the microfiche, show the microfilm, and then this whole uh, circus will be all over. Of course, everybody's zipped up about it. Um, it's, it's political suicide 
in the mainstream to touch this issue. Exactly, and, and Sheriff Joe Arpaio touched a little bit upon uh, on that when you got a chance to interview him uh, from the press conference in Phoenix, Arizona. We're going to run a clip of that right now, and this is Arpaio as he talks about the media blackout surrounding the Barack Obama birth certificate scandal. The majority of politicians don't even want to talk about it, Republicans and Democrats. It's like the plague to talk about this. I've never seen anything like this, and I've been a top federal law enforcement official for years and years. I'm not dropping this. I'm not dropping this. I'm going to keep moving forward. Well, the guy's got guts. I'll give him that. I mean, he's taking on the alien in the White House as much as, uh, as well as getting a lot of harsh criticism from the mainstream media at the same time. And what do you say to critics who are saying that Arpaio is either a racist or he's a paranoid conspiracy theorist? Well, I think both of those are typical accusations, similar to a straw man case in order to shoot the messenger. And really what it is is Joe Arpaio is the only law enforcement official brave enough in the whole of the United States to take on this issue which is, you know, politically uh, too hot to handle for both the mainstream media and the law enforcement agencies around the country. But, you know, the, the answer to your first question, Darren, is yes, the president does have something to hide. And there's proof of this. The first executive order signed by President Barack Obama when he took into office in January of his first term was Executive Order 13489. This is the president's records executive order, which effectively seals all the president's history of all his records in college, application forms, um, financial aid, grades, transcripts, you name it. All and the White House and Obama spent upwards of $5 million with the law firm in Seattle called Coe Perkins, top law firm in Seattle. They spent that money to find the legal justification for the president to seal all of his records. This is unprecedented in American history, and it's it's kind of shameful in a way that you have you have president of the United States that has to hide his whole past. So basically, everything about this guy is a complete fiction. Uh, I just spoke to Jerome Corsi uh, today, and he's under kind of a gag order for the next two weeks, which you guys are already aware of. Uh, they're going to be releasing new information. They've cold cases made a trip to Hawaii and. Um, Dug, dug a little deeper and, and obviously found quite a bit to uh, buttress their own case against the president. And this is also in the in wake of the Arizona Secretary of State's effort to uh, keep Obama off the voter roll, off the, sorry, off the presidential ballot in November. And he folded under pressure uh, and Hawaii uh, issued a statement to Arizona saying that uh, it was officially verified that this was the president's birth certificate, which is nothing more than me getting a note from somebody saying that my driving license is, is okay uh, without actually having seen the driving license. So that's basically what you've got. Well, that's right. And you're talking about Arizona Secretary of State Ken Bennett. Uh, he threatened to keep Obama off the presidential ballot if Hawaii could not produce a hard copy of the document. But now he's backpedaling. He's Ken Bennett and he ain't in it. I mean, he's and he's even apologizing now for embarrassing Arizona for asking for proof of the birth certificate uh, to begin with. So he's really backing down. Meanwhile, in Hawaii, they still refuse to comply with the request to allow public inspection of the original documents. They just sent out a letter saying, yes, he was born here and we're all supposed to accept that. Well, there's a huge amount of political pressure put to bear on Arizona state officials. Carl Seal, Representative Carl Seal, spearheaded a bill called the President's uh, Certification Bill or Candidate Certification Bill, which basically passed through the, the Senate and through the House. It had enough co-sponsors, and it got intentionally buried in the uh, uh, the, the President of the Senate's office, uh, Steve Pierce, for reasons unknown. Now, you can imagine from the governor right down the chain, uh, Arizona uh, has a lot of uh, dealings with the federal government right now. There's a DOJ lawsuit um, over SB 1070, was in the Supreme Court. You've got um, the federal government is withholding approximately $4 billion in money that it owes the state of Arizona for uh, looking after the border and uh, 
taking care of uh, illegal immigrants and incarcerating them and you name it. They, they owe that money. And so you can imagine the White House is holding a gun to the head of Arizona. And Bennett, it, it, it's not unlikely in these situations he would have got a warning uh, either through back channels or, or whatever. Oh, sure, uh, sure. I, I feel he... <laughs> He changed his mind suddenly for, for good reason, uh, or for some reason, I'm sure. Back to the birth certificate, the actual document, it's an obvious fake. It's um, amateur at best. And, you know, the PDF file was released last year by the White House. Anyone could download it. And, you know, it didn't take us but a few minutes before we here at InfoWars, we put it into, you know, Illustrator, Adobe Photoshop, and immediately, you could see that there's multiple layers on there. You can move these layers around. So again, and, and not to take anything away from Arpaio and his team of investigators, but this was about as simple as a, an investigation can get, you know. And um, were they surprised when they saw what an amateur job this was? What was their reaction? Well, you know, Mike Zula was the uh, head of the investigating team. 20-some-odd uh, tw years experience in law enforcement uh, on the state level and I believe the federal level. But um, he, he, was, he was shocked by what he found um, because they did work hours and weeks testing and retesting. They went to multiple experts to get second, third, fourth opinions on this uh, flimsy version of a birth certificate that they put up on the White House website. So they were they were surprised, but you know, th th there's so much going on with this federal government. It's it's absolutely unreal, and this Obama birth certificate issue really falls under the banner, a larger umbrella of states' rights, and that's something that I've tried to point out from the beginning. So all these battles with the federal government is the state has the right to call its own elections. You know, it's 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 in the Tenth Amendment. You know, it's part of the Bill of Rights. You know, the, the power is not granted to the federal government nor prohibited to the states by the Constitution are reserved to the states or the people. It's as simple as that. If the people of Arizona want to take Obama off the presidential ballot because they don't believe he's qualified, then they have a right to. Now, in Florida, there's 180,000 illegal immigrants that have been found on Florida's voting rolls. OK, now the federal government and Eric Holder is ordering Florida to stop removing illegal immigrants from the voting rolls. They've already removed 2,700, and there's a, a estimated over 180,000 of these in Florida. This is a this is a White House that's depending on fraud to get reelected in November. This is this is really uh, scandals. I can't even count how many scandals we have with this federal government. Well, and this, this whole birth certificate issue isn't going to go away anytime soon. Our pile's not going to be given up anytime soon, and unless he steps in front of a bus or gets really depressed all of a sudden. You know, let's hope he doesn't end up uh, like Breitbart or Breitbart's corner, for example. But there, uh, you know, we've talked to investigative journalist Wayne Madsen. We've talked to historian Webster Tarpley and others who have said that Obama actually worked for the CIA in the past and perhaps was even raised by the CIA, a real Manchurian candidate, if you will. Now, Pio hasn't gone that far, but who knows where this investigation will go from here. What's next for the cold case posse? What are they going to work on next? And what do you think uh, the Obama administration is going to try to do to block any further investigation? Well, uh, out of the uh, reports from Hawaii, I've been told by Jerome Corsi that they have dam more damning evidence, but uh, he can't release or talk about it uh, for their reasons until the press conference, which is going to be in the next two weeks. So that's something to look out for. Sure. Uh, the other thing, of course, he has been investigating, and you have to remember, Jerome Corsi has got a PhD from Harvard. He's a he's a top historian. He is a, a tireless investigator. He's got uh, evidence that possibly links uh, Obama's real father. In other words, it's not Obama Senior from Kenya. Uh, it's it's quite possibly someone like uh, Frank Marshall Davis, That's right. who is an absolute doppelganger for Barack Obama. Yep. Um, with big ears and everything, but uh, he was a his Frank Marshall Davis was a community organizer in Chicago, ran the Star newspaper, and he was mentioned in Obama's uh, book Dreams of My Father as his uh, his mentor. Okay, he's a co Communist Party member, 
um, uh, completely uh, uh, someone exactly like Bill Ayers. Okay, so you can, he's a journalist, labor union activist, was a, could, have been, could have been working for the CIA as a, a labor union embedded uh, agitator like Bill Ayers is probably an FBI or a CIA informant. Everybody go look into that because that's quite likely the case, okay, whether underground. But Frank Marshall Davis, Obama's father, um, they sure look like <laughs> he sure got his face and his ears. Yes, but, he does. Uh, <laughs> that, that's another thing that, that, that could come out. I mean, how many more lies about this president? Well, we don't know who he is. We don't know who, who he is at this point. Uh, so he's really a ghost president with a ghost past. Um, who knows where this investigation will go from here? I'm certainly going to be at the edge of my seat looking forward to see what they uncover. Uh, Patrick, it's good to have you on with us today. I look forward to your next articles and your next uh, video journalism reports, too. They're coming in uh, left and right, so you're putting a lot of those out as well. It's good to have you on the team, and I uh, hope to have you back on the show real, real soon. Thanks, Darren. All right, bud. Take care, man. All righty, then, and that just about does it for tonight's show. But before we go... I'm going to read you today's quote of the day, and this one from Henry Kissinger during Bilderberg 1992 in Avion, France. He says, Today, Americans would be outraged if UN troops entered Los Angeles to restore order. Tomorrow, they will be grateful. This is especially true if they were told there was an outside threat from beyond, whether real or promulgated that threatened our very existence. It is then that all peoples of the world will pledge with world leaders to deliver them from this evil. The one thing every man fears is the unknown. When presented with this scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished for the guarantee of their well-being granted to them by their world government. I'm Darren McBreen, and uh, we will be back, God willing, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock Central Time, Texas time, that is. And it'll either be Alex Jones or Aaron Dykes will be sitting here as they have triumphantly returned from their showdown with the global mafia that is Bilderberg 2012 in Chantilly, Virginia. So we'll be back tomorrow night. Until then, God bless. Have a good evening.